Yeah. So, so the influence of Zarathustra. So Pythagoras, okay. Uh, Pythag Look, Pythagoras is the first philosopher. He's like the Abraham of the Greeks. He, well, God's forbid, God's forbid that we should ever compare him to Abraham. God's for, look, this is even from a Gnostic perspective, utter heresy, right? Okay. <laughs> Abraham was a child murdering, you know, mindless zombie listening to a psychopathic voice from heaven. And Pythagoras was a torchbearer of wisdom and enlightenment for humanity. But I take your point, meaning like he's the forerunner of the entire the father of everything, right? You know, tradition in, in Greece. Um, because nobody used the word philosophy before Pythagoras or the word philosopher. He's the one who coins the term. And where is the word uh, philosopher or philosophy didn't exist in Greek? It did in ancient Iranian. Zarathustra wasn't a Zoroastrian. And he didn't call his doctrine Zoroastrianism. He called it Mazda Yasna, which means reverence for wisdom. And a person following it was a Mazda Yasin, a, re a reverer of wisdom. And in particular, in the teaching of Zarathustra, you do not worship Ahura Mazda. You are a friend of Ahura Mazda. That's the term that he uses. Wow. You choose to be a friend of Ahura Mazda and the relationship to the wisdom, the titanic wisdom is a relationship of friendship. So philosophia, philia means friendship in Greek, and Sophia means wisdom. So Pythagoras is just translating Mazda Yasna into Greek when he coins the term philosophy or the term philosopher. And we know this is the case because the man spent a decade, more than a decade, in the capital of the Persian Empire. When Pythagoras was young, he went to Egypt. And while he was in Egypt, studying with the priests uh, and measuring the pyramid, measure, measuring the inside of the king's chamber, to get the Pythagorean theorem and so on and so forth, he was arrested by the military forces of Cambyses II. Cambyses II was the son of Cyrus the Great. He was the second emperor of the Persian Empire. And as a joke, he had Pythagoras arrested the way that in Plato's Republic, there's a scene at the beginning uh, where Socrates is arrested by his friends uh, in other words, they force him to come and have a philosophical discussion right. with them. They're like, we're not, we're not going to let you go, man. You're going to come and you're going to talk to us. And we're going to get some, we're going to pick your brains and get some wisdom out of your head. Like what I'm doing with you right now. Well, maybe <laughs> just... in, in any case. Um, so they grab this guy and they say that, listen, the king really wants to talk to you. Please come back with us, whether you want it or not. You're coming back with us to Babylon, to the capital of the Persian empire. And, you know, we want you to sit with the Magi and the king and, you know, Talk to us. And so he goes back with them and he spends uh, 10 to 12 years. That's what I've heard, yep. Over a decade studying with, and I think probably to some exchange, it was a you know, you know, two-way relationship, uh, working with the Magi, okay? The Zoroastrian priests in the capital of the Persian Empire a dozen years. Now, I'm not sure if you know about this, but among the stuff that's found from Marcus Aurelius in his writings, he's got Greek translations of Zoroaster. And I'm wondering, this is maybe through Pythagoras somehow it gets passed down, or is no he? No doubt. Yeah. Listen, I'm sure these writings were common both in the Pythagorean schools and also in the Platonic Academy, ultimately. And the reason they didn't get to us is because of the burning of the Library of Alexandria right. and in Corinth and various other places, you know, where these libraries were torched. <sighs> Uh, so, so look, um, and, and by the way, let me just, th th this is not a side note. This is actually really relevant. One way we know that's true. And I'm just not making some anti-Christian claim, like, you know, off the top of my head or what are pulling it out of somewhere is because we know there was this guy, Anacarsis of Scythia, who was another one living around the time of Zarathustra between Zarathustra and Pythagoras. And he was a Scythian by paternal descent whose mother was Greek. And he went from Scythia, in other words, from northern Iran to Athens, where he became friends with Solon. And he was also known as one of the most, in fact, besides Zarathustra, Anacarsis is the first pre-Socratic philosopher. 
and he had a notorious reputation, this guy did. Um, uh, he was basically a, a philosophical anarchist, and we can come back to this. You know, a lot of what becomes the teaching of Gautama Buddha, I think, is deeply influenced by Anacarsis of Scythia. A lot of what becomes Taoism, deeply influenced by Anacarsis of Scythia's deconstruction of polar opposites and his critique of emergent rationality um, and his old notion of basically, uh, you know, nature as a flux and um, uh, the dynamic interplay of, of opposites. Uh, and the lack of any um, objective criteria for making judgments about things. He was like a proto-cynic in a lot of ways. Wow. And, okay, and he was Iranian, all right? He's coming from the same cultural milieu as Zarathustra. But here's the thing. He, there are no writings of his that have survived. This, this guy wrote a shit ton. People quoted him in various books. And we don't have anything from Anacarsis of Scythia. It, so said, therefore, go ahead. You said he met Solon, the lawgiver? He's, he was friends with him. He was personal friends with him. Solon said, he came and he said to Solon, hey, you know, I came here to be your friend. You know, I think we could we really, you know, have a profitable relationship. Solon said to him, you know, it's best to make friends at home. I Meaning, get lost, man. Well, you're, you're some foreigner, you know, get the hell out of here. And he said, well, you know, since you're at home, you should make friends with me. And anyway, the two of them struck yeah. up a yeah, in Athens, yeah. Okay, okay. He moved to Athens. He was an Iranian who moved to Athens. Because there is a story that Solon goes to Heliopolis, because that was where the Great Library was before Alexandria. Yeah. And so this is after that? I'm not sure when in Solon's okay. life it was, whether it was before he went to Egypt or after he went to Egypt or at what point. But, but that's it, still fascinating that he has it. Well, I, actually, I can tell you, it was, it was in 589 B.C., so people familiar with the life of Solon, they can figure out whether it was before or after he went to Egypt, but- Leave it in the comments. There you yeah. go. Yeah, <laughs> so, but, but, but just notice the date here. Anacarsis came to Athens in 589 BC. When was the likely date that Zarathustra composed the Gothas? 580 BC. So this is within nine years. Wow, so now we can start, start pinpointing when things happen now. Exactly. Yeah. So this is, you know, I, it makes a lot of sense Zarathustra would have been at this time and would have been a major catalytic force for the rise of pre-Socratic philosophy. Uh, in any case, why did I bring up Anacarsis? Yeah, it's obvious we lost a lot of these writings and that there were definitely um, texts by Zarathustra other than the Gathas and other, uh, I hesitate to call them Zoroastrian texts, texts of Mazda Yasna, Iranian wisdom, translated into Greek, which were in these libraries and which we lost through the catastrophic rise of the Catholic Church and so forth. Um, but in any case, okay, we got sidetracked. Pythagoras. Yeah. So he studies for a, a dozen years in the capital of the Persian Empire with the Magi, the, the priests who have adopted the doctrine of Zarathustra. So obviously this guy, he's got to have been under massive influence from the teaching of Zarathustra. And you can see it reflected in Pythagoras' teaching. He has this notion of peras and aperon, that there are these two principles that work in the cosmos. One is a principle of order. This is what, you know, when he says everything is number, right? Pythagoras is saying there is this principle of limit and limitation and demarcation, peras. And what it is demarcating and limiting is a peron, a chaotic unlimited. Okay. And this chaotic unlimited is like a, it's like a vortex. It's like a black hole. Like, you know, the event horizon of a black hole tears everything apart, right? So this is like Angraminu. This is like the force of chaos and disorder. So you see this at the heart of the ontology of Pythagoras. You also see um, that Pythagoras, and I neglected to mention this earlier in terms of Zarathustra, but I'm coming back to it now. Pythagoras has a exceptional respect for women and a, you know, a promotion of the, the bizarre notion at the time that radically countercultural notion that women should have equality of opportunity. He uh, took women as students into the Pythagorean school, and some of them rose to be teachers in the Pythagorean order. Um, and this is something you find in the Gathas of Zarathustra as well. Zarathustra, I mean, this is unheard. It's six, in 600 BC, this guy is talking about the equality of women and wow. how women have conscience and rationality and should make their own choices in life. And he officiates at his daughter's wedding and like gives this whole sermon about how her life is her own and she should make her own choices and so and, and so forth. And this could possibly be from this Dana idea from Zoroaster. Yeah, and let's not oh, forget. Yeah. Wisdom. Let's not forget. 
a whole third of the Iranian community in those, or a fourth of the Iranian community in those days, the Sarmatians, were a matriarchal society who became the basis for the Amazon myths mm-hmm. among the Greeks. That's a really good point. This is all coming together now. And plus, the Greeks used to say about the Persians that the Persians were, <laughs> they used to say they were pansies yeah, and I mean, basically cucks who were like under the thumb of their women. And, they're, you know, at the Persian court, and the, you know, women called all the shots and so on and so forth. And, uh, and because the Greeks were extremely patriarchal, you know, paternalistic people. But, yeah, in the ancient Persian military, you had female admirals in the Persian Navy. OK, so. All right. So uh, Pythagoras is also getting this from the teaching of Zarathustra, the place that women have in the Pythagorean order. And his notions of uh, justice and of how governments should be run are clearly based on Zarathustra's idea of vohu khashatra, the best uh, governance or the most righteous form of regime, which is the rule of philosophers. Okay, the, the system that he was setting up in real life with Kavi Vishtaspa, his patron, where basically he was a court philosopher determining court policy. And so this is an idea that Pythagoras is getting from Zarathustra and that then Plato, as a member of the Pythagorean order, adopts and articulates in Republic as, I was about to say philosopher kingship, but really it should be called philosopher guardianship because women can be philosopher rulers as well. Interesting. So you find all these ideas, you know, in uh, the teachings of Pythagoras that are, and then of course, you know, uh, when we talk about archetypes, right? As I mentioned earlier, the whole notion of uh, archetypes that you find at the core of Platonic ontology comes from the Pythagorean order. Plato is getting that right. uh, through his membership in this secret society. And Pythagoras is getting that uh, from Zarathustra via the Magi that he's studying with for a dozen years in the capital of the Persian Empire. Now, it's also noteworthy that Pythagoras only leaves Iran and goes, and let's remember, okay, Babylon. Okay, it's in Iraq today. Iraq is a fake country. Iraq was created by the British colonialists. It's a fake country. The capital of Iran was in Iraq for four Iranian empires. The capital, not only was Iraq part of Iran, it was the capital district, okay? So this Mesopotamia has spent the better part of the past 2,500 years as part of Iran, integral part of Iran. uh, except for the period where the Ottoman Turks overran it and ruled it for a while before the British carved Iraq. Anyway, point being that um, he only leaves Iran, Pythagoras does, when the Persian Empire conquers his native island of Samos. Right. Then Pythagoras, From Samos, and he goes to Italy and sets up in Croton, Italy. Exactly. So how come, how come Pythagoras only leaves Iran when Iran conquers Samos? If you were some nationalist Greek, right? You would hate the Persians for conquering your homeland. No, this guy only leaves Iran and goes back to his homeland once it's under Iranian rule. Okay, so he's clearly aligned, right? And then he goes, and we're going to talk about Heraclitus too, and, you know, his politics and how that was aligned with the Persian Empire. But he goes from Samos, as you mentioned, to Italy, and he sets up the Pythagorean schools in southern Italy. Well, if you ask me what this looks like is he was sent on a mission, yeah. The Magi sent him, they said, okay, go now. He was an evangelist, basically. Go now and pa- preach this doctrine in the West, spread this wisdom in the West. And he sets up these schools in Italy, which then are burned down by the local, uh, you know, feudal Umbria. aristocracy, because these guys don't want their women in school. They don't want, you know, their women becoming, uh, you know, uppity and talking back and not being good ho- housewives who can, you know, be in the kitchen. And so on and so on and so right. forth. Yeah, they were like a warrior warrior cult back over there, basically. Yeah, the, Pythagoras tried to basically seize control of the government of southern Italy. Um, he had basically uh, all these politicians he was training to carry out a coup d'etat and create a philosopher kingship in southern Italy. And the local landed aristocracy became wise to this, and they burned down the Pythagorean schools. But of course, the schools spread, and then we had important initiates of these schools, most notably Plato. Uh, and so then this Zoroastrian influence gets passed on to Plato. Okay, so, but Pythagoras is, is an important figure here because why? Who were the 
two people besides Jesus that the Carpocratians set up statues of. Plato. Pythagoras and Heraclitus. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Plato. Pythagoras and Plato. Who were the two major influences on Plato? Pythagoras. So people think, okay, of Socrates when they think of Plato, all right? But I'm going to make a very long story short. Socrates was a war veteran who was a bum on the streets. <laughs> Socrates was like a Vietnam war vet bum who was a real wise ass. That's the kind of person he was. Plato takes him and he turns him to this grand dramatic persona after the death of Socrates. So it's true that Socrates was important like for Plato when Plato was a teenager or very young man in his early 20s and whatever. He was an early mentor to him, but he was like a bum on the street who was... Because he also teaches people like Diogenes and you get the cynics that come out of him too. Exactly. So that's, exactly. Yeah. that's the type he is. Yeah. But Socrates wasn't an important influence on Plato in terms of his thinking. The doctrines that Plato puts in the mouth of Socrates are influenced by two figures in particular. One is Pythagoras, because Plato went on to join the Pythagorean order after that he was a sworn brother of the order, which this could be a whole other program talk about, you know, the Illuminati and the beginning of the Illuminati and, you know, who Plato really was and how much he left unsaid in his writings and so on and so forth, his esoteric doctrine. That's the next one. The, the other thing, uh, the other major influence on Plato was Heraclitus. Right. Aristotle tells us that in the period after the death of Socrates and before Plato joined the Pythagorean order, why, why are we going through all this? Because of the Carpocratians. And they worship Plato together with Pythagoras and Jesus. So Aristotle tells us that in that period after the death of Socrates and before uh, Plato becomes a sworn member of the Pythagorean order. Plato studied under this Heraclitean teacher, Cratylus. And Plato was a, a zealous Heraclitean. He had completely internalized the worldview of Heraclitus. And Aristotle says it's only on the basis of the Heraclitean worldview that Plato then builds up this ontology of an epistemology of forms. Uh, you know, the, the concepts, the eidos and so on and so forth. But the, the backdrop for Plato's sophisticated ontology and epistemology of forms is an acceptance of Heraclitus's view of the world as flux and various other notions of Heraclitus about the nature of cosmic justice and so forth. So who are the two main influences on Plato? Heraclitus and Pythagoras. Okay, we talked about Pythagoras' connection to Iran and to Zarathustra. Absolutely, you demonstrated that, yeah. Now let's, let's talk about Heraclitus, all right? Because yeah, this Heraclitus. A lot of people, a lot of people bring this up, that Heraclitus is very Zoroastrian in his thinking. So let's, let's go through this. Heraclitus has a number of ideas in his, in his uh, well, we call it fragments. It was a book that was called On Nature, and now only fragments are left of it. He has a number of ideas in that text that have no precedent in Greek culture, uh, but align directly with Zarathustra's teaching. He criticizes all the Greeks and in, in their, in their, like, like he, he's very much like a, a Tupac of his day, like criticizing everyone else, but like, yeah, being like a sort of like going against the grain. Look, he attacks Homer and he yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> vehemently. I mean, this would be the equivalent of being a Satanist in that time. You're attacking, you're ripping the Bible to pieces. Right. Homer and Hesiod were the Bible of that time, and he's just trashing them. Right. Okay? And uh, so, the, yeah. Uh, now, why is he trashing them? Because very much in alignment with Zarathustra, Heraclitus is saying that, these gods that these guys write about, Homer and Hesiod, these Olympians, these are not the true divinities. The true divinity is a divine mind, okay? It's a divine mind that expresses itself as cosmic order and that is best symbolized by an undying and ever-changing fire. Smenta Minu and Ashal Vahishta. Okay, Smenta Minu is the cosmic order and Asha Vahishta is its being symbol, best symbolized by fire or energy ever-changing in its forms. And another idea that you find it, uh, there is that everything in nature advances, proceeds, unfolds according to dialectical opposition. There is a struggle between dialectically opposed forces, forces that 
they, they are in tension with one another and their dynamic tension is creative or constructive. And it's what moves the world forward. Well, this is also at the core of the teaching of Zarathustra in that, and he, this is a very subtle and important point. Angraminu is also necessary. You don't want to get rid of Angraminu. Angraminu or Ahriman is also necessary. It's the struggle between Sepantaminu and Angraminu that makes the world work. It's like when a fire or when a forest burns down, it, it comes back even greater and there's more life after that. Sort of. Yes. And it's also like a chess game. Yeah. Angraminu are the black pieces on the board. And so uh, the divine mind of Ahura Mazda wants an opponent. Right. And notice this, this, uh, the ethos behind this mentality, right? It's a very chivalric, noble-minded ethos, which says, I want evil to go ahead and do its best. I want an opponent. It's the, it's the Olympics ethos, the ethos of agonistic struggle that we find in the Greek Olympics. You have to have that contrast to make yeah. that move. Well, and also, it's not just the contrast. It's what makes you your best. You, you play your best game against a strong opponent. Exactly. But it takes a certain depth of soul to have that kind of ethos, right? I mean, really niggardly, petty people want to just eliminate all opposition. The strong and noble-minded person, a free spirit, wants to face the best opposition so that they can become the best version of themselves and find out what they're really capable of. And so this is also a notion of Zarathustra that winds up at the heart of the teaching of Heraclitus. And then there are these peculiar things in there that there's nowhere they could have come from but from Zarathustra and Iranian culture. Like Heraclitus says, don't keep corpses around and, you know, uh, engage in ceremonial, like, uh, you know, um, uh, rites around corpses and right. bury them. Or whatever. He says, throw them out like dung. Throw corpses out quicker than crap, literally, is what he puts in his text. That's literally what's written in Zen and Vesta. Like, exactly. You can, so you can the, rip your nails off and throw that on the ground. That's got to be disposed in a certain way. Zoroastrians would take corpses immediately to the outskirts of the city, and they would put them on these uh, rocky outcrops for vultures to descend on the corpses and basically to feed nature. Because you don't need your body anymore at that point. Your spirit has gone on. So they just take the corpses. And they strip them down to the bone in these places and let vultures feed on them. In any case, they throw them out from the populated area. And Heraclitus says this in the fragments. Well, this is totally anathema to traditional Greek funerary rites. Um, and there's only one place he could have gotten it from. And then when we look at his politics, okay, it's just, it's just absolutely undeniably obvious when we look at Heraclitus' politics. He is vehemently opposed to democracy. He believes that the wise should rule and that the best men, meaning the ones with the most cultivated intellect, should be the guardians of a society. And he's so committed to this idea that when his personal friend, Hermodorus, the satrap, the Persian governor of Ephesus, okay, so Heraclitus' buddy was the Persian governor of Ephesus, a guy called Hermodorus. And when this guy is overthrown in an Ephesian revolt against Persian rule, Heraclitus says of his fellow citizens, they should all be hanged to the last man and the city should be left to the children. Yeah, and that's, by the way, this, this is in Turkey. So it's not like he's like in the, like he's in Asia already. So it's- He's in the Persian empire. This is a part of Greece that was ruled by the Persian empire. His buddy- Hermodorus is literally the Persian governor, the governor the Persians appointed to rule Ephesus. And when Hermodorus is, is deposed in an attempted coup by the Ephesians, an attempted Greek revolt against Persian rule, he says, these Greeks here, these morons, these rabble, he calls them rabble, uneducated, mass, unthinking herd of people who, in the name of democracy, revolted against Hermodorus. He says they should all be executed to the last man. Leave the children to run the city. <laughs> and then, okay, so. He was a then, contemporary of Thales too. Thales was a monotheist, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And then in the midst of this situation, 
Darius, the Persian emperor, sends a letter to Heraclitus saying, come be the court philosopher of Iran. Wow. Darius the Great, in all of his inscriptions on mountainsides in Iran, on rock cliffs in Iran, prefaces his decrees with, in the name of Ahura Mazda right. and of Arta. Absolutely. Order. Absolutely the, Zoroastrian. So he's a Zoroastrian monarch. He's legitimating himself through the teachings of Zarathustra. And he says to Heraclitus, come be the court philosopher of the Persian Empire. Now, if you didn't think that this guy was Zoroastrian in his thinking, they wouldn't we'll want him there. Him. There's no way he'd be, he would be asked to be a court philosopher if he didn't already have a line thinking to a high degree, too, not just a little, exactly. to a high if, degree. If he didn't epitomize the worldview of the ancient Iranians. Wow. So this is, this is really telling. And then what does Heraclitus do? He writes him back and he basically says, thank you, but no thank you. I don't think court life would suit me. It's a little too luxurious for me, and I'm not going to abandon my post. Yeah. And, you know, you should come here. And so instead, Heraclitus goes and he, he exiles himself to the Temple of Artemis. He doesn't leave the temple for the rest of his life uh, because his attitude is basically, I hate these people. These are, these are not my kinsmen. These people who revolted against her, her you know, her moderates, uh, who revolted against the Persians. And he makes the Temple of Artemis, again, Arta Amesha, immortal truth this iranian goddess figure right uh he makes her temple his home for the rest of his life and this is where the fragments were you know kept uh the first copy of the fragments were kept by the priestesses of the temple of artemis and he would only come out to play with children on the steps of the temple the children that you know parents would bring when they came to worship artemis they would leave their children on the temple steps and Heraclitus would be out there playing games with these children. He's like, they're my, I prefer to talk to them than to talk, talk to any of you. I'll, I'll play with the children. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so, so anyway, and by the way, there's this beautiful fragment uh, where he says that the Aeon is a child at play, moving pieces in a game. Sovereignty belongs to the child. Wow. And this is Heraclitus understanding what Zarathustra really was after in this opposition between Sepantaminu and Angraminu as part of the divine intelligence of Ahura Mazda, where there is a cosmic game on, like a chess game, uh, or like backgammon, which is Iranian in origin. And the point is to, uh, to play a good game yeah. and a creative game. Uh, in any case, I think that Heraclitus did that. He, he maintained his post. He uh, sequestered himself to the Temple of Artemis um, because he was waiting for Darius to come to him, not the other way around. In other words, he was saying to the Persian emperor, you come back and reassert rule here and in, and in Greece in general. And so in this person, very much like Pythagoras, we're dealing with an agent of the Persian empire. These were, these were progressive minds that saw the Persian post, saw the, the rule of Darius and Cyrus as like the, uh, a, a modern or an ancient rendition of what today is like the UN, like overarching, but also just fair, knowledgeable, uh, intelligent, and good for the world instead of having like warring states periods. Yeah. I mean, the United Nations is so corrupt. Right. Uh, I'm just so saying the idea, country, the idea. You know what I think it's more like? I'll tell you what I think it's more like. It's like the United States at its foundation. The uh, Persian Empire, the United States, you know, Thomas Jefferson. Washington. Was very, yeah. Thomas Jefferson was very deeply influenced by uh, Iranian ideas that he got from reading Greek authors. He had a vast library of classical Greek texts. He read Greek and he was influenced by the Persians via the Greeks. And so yeah. the federal constitution of the United States was very much a reflection of the satrapy system of the Persian Empire. Exactly. Uh, not Judeo-Christian, because think about it. There's not a single script, not a single lick of Deuteronomy or numbers in the Constitution. It is. I mean, it's preposterous. Look, Jefferson took scissors to the Bible. I mean, this is a whole other conversation. We can the yeah, founding yeah, yeah. fathers despised Christianity. The founding fathers, Jefferson, uh, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, the Illuminati, 33rd degree of Freemason. Anyway, be that as it may. But to go to your point, it's more not like the UN so much. It's more like when Tom Paine 
says, um, in, I think it was in The Rights of Man, the book that he wrote in, did he write The Rights of Man in Prison in France? I think so. Yeah. Uh, and, and so he, he, Tom Paine, the black sheep of the founding fathers, he says that the liberty bell of the American Revolution is not just for all nations on earth. It should resound through the whole cosmos. And Same guy who called Christ a fable, too. <laughs> oh, he, he destroyed the Bible. Yeah. He, and, and by the way, not only did he, did he uh, think the U.S. Constitution shouldn't be based on the Bible, he said that the U.S. Constitution is not compatible with Christianity. Absolutely. And until we get rid of Christianity, we cannot have a functional government in this country. Anyway, be that as it may, when Paine is saying that the American Revolution and the system of liberty and the protection of personal rights that it's setting up is a standard for the whole world, that's what the ancient Persian emperors were after. They were after creating a universal order based on progress and the liberty of the individual. Uh, so, yeah, in any case. Yeah, you just laid out, like, un I think it's ex just completely clear that these pillars of the West, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, and then eventually Plato, and then, you know, who would be sort of passed down through the Aristotelian mind and which branches out in many different directions. This comes from Zoroaster. He's the, he's the monad in, 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 its, own, in its own way, like to use so, the figure of speech. Where am I going with this? Where I'm going with this is that, look, if the, if the Carpocratians are worshiping statues of or at least honoring statues of Pythagoras and then of Plato, who's influenced by Pythagoras and Heraclitus. What does that tell you about where the Carpocratian teaching is coming from originally, right? Um, and I want to come back to the Carpocratians in, in one minute, and this is going to become really important. Uh, the point about uh, Zarathustra and the Carpocratians and then Persian Gnosticism. But let me also note that in your, I was listening to your conversation with, is it David Lit, David Lit, Litwa? I'm, I'm David Litwa. Yeah. And uh, Litwa, in response to a question you asked very rightly about Persian influence on Simon Magus. And Litwa says, no, you know, there was a much closer source for Simon Magus than anything Zoroastrian, and that would have been Heraclitus. Well, we've already established how deeply influenced by Zarathustra Heraclitus is, okay? But I don't buy that Simon Magus is getting these ideas even from Zarathustra via Heraclitus. I think he's getting them directly from Zarathustra. And I'll tell you why. When he describes the, you know, uh, divine intelligence, not just as a cosmic fire, which is a very Zoroastrian symbol that you find in Heraclitus. Yes, he calls God a fire. He said God yeah. is a fire. Yeah. He also... Uh, talks about the seventh power, and you don't find this in Heraclitus. This is nowhere in Heraclitus. It's nowhere in any Greek thought. The seventh power or emanation of the divine intelligence, which is thought, the divine thought, right? The thinking power of the divine, which is a seventh emanation. That's sepantominu. There are seven amesha spenta, seven of them. The seventh one, the highest one, is sepantominu, which is what? The power of thought. The divine thought, right? 